This video was made possible in part by contributions to my Patreon from viewers like you. Thank you. This album is a celebration. My pain exploding in electronic music. It's heavy, but after I listen to it, I feel happy again. I feel lighter. On November 11th, 2019, Lady Gaga tweeted one sentence that set the internet on fire. I don't remember art pop. Little Monsters, that's what she calls her fan base, by the way, reacted with overwhelming despair. A flood of trending hashtags, memes, and precious memories connected to the 2013 album. Upon release, art pop wasn't well received by audiences or critics, but in the decades since has seen mass reevaluation by both. Nowadays, the following arguments tend to dominate the internet. Art pop was doomed by bad marketing, controversial collaborations and cancellations, disputes between Lady Gaga and Interscope, a messy departure from her team, a serious hip injury that left Gaga unable to tour, a planned and canceled art pop part two, and various controversies that in the end prove either inconsequential compared to the album's immense artistic merit or overshadow whatever artistic merit the album has but it's not my intention to tell the disastrous history of art pop, nor the more recent reevaluation. Sure, a little contextual history is inevitable, but the story behind this album has reached an almost mythic status that, frankly, does not need to be retread by yet another YouTuber. Check out the videos in my description instead, they are well worth your time. Bad marketing and troubled production may explain middling sales and chart performance, but I could not care less about middling sales and chart performance. All of this history and context does not explain how one of the world's biggest stars made a great album that received lukewarm critical reviews, especially when the album itself is just so good. Art pop has gained a cult status akin to any late 20th century animated film that isn't Disney. It's obscene, at times uncomfortable and insensitive. It swings between sincerity and satire, and it's the opposite of its era sensibilities. But that's also what makes it great. The fact of the matter is, although art pop has received some positive, even apologetic, critical reevaluation, it is still often considered Lady Gaga's biggest mistake. An incongruous mess that can't decide whether it wants to be high art or lowbrow club music. Contemporaneously, critics complained that the album was too conceptual to be top 40 and too poppy to be prog. It's true that art pop perches in the uncomfortable and precarious in-between. What I'll never understand is how so many missed that that's the point of the album. It plays with kitsch, it experiments with camp, it juxtaposes painful sincerity regarding instances of systemic abuse with a Muppets Christmas special? I don't know about you guys, but I get kind of party nauseous just thinking about it. <laughs> so let's examine art pop not from the lens of commercial flop. Rather, let's examine its songwriting. Let's unearth those themes, symbols, motifs, narrative arcs, or let's reframe it this way. Fandom culture and stan culture in particular has a habit of defining a text by its paratext. At the end of the day, an album is just as good as the songs it contains and whether or not you feel something listening to them. Art Pop is an album that expressed female rage and industry abuses pre-Me Too, that asks where, if anywhere, can women exist in art, while also expressing a disdain for the gender binary in general. It's an album that embraces and challenges the critical lens of poptimism before it even peaked in popularity. Art Pop is messy. Art Pop is hard to pin down. Art Pop could mean anything or nothing at all. Lady Gaga showed us the girl behind the aura and we looked away. But if you're ready to see her rocket number nine, take off. Hello, my name is Petka. I am the interface of this application. Before you can exist in the universe of our pop, I must first generate your aura. Do you wanna touch me cause me the love Do you wanna be good Type in your name.
It's great to branch out and do textual analysis of various kinds on this channel. I always love talking about music, but I'll admit it can be pretty intimidating to cover a star as big as Lady Gaga. I owe a lot to brilliant creators like Twelve Tone, Todd in the Shadows, and Polyphonic, who over the years have taught me so much. You'll be hearing their voices throughout this video, and wouldn't you know it, they're also fellow creators on Nebula, the largest creator-owned internet streaming platform. My personal recommendation? Lindsay Ellis' new video, The Ballad of John and Yoko, which is only available on Nebula. Writing this art pop essay meant spending a lot of time looking at misogynistic reviews and parodies that sprung up around Lady Gaga over the course of her early career. Yet, maybe no woman has faced greater hate and speculation in the music world than Yoko Ono. Blamed for breaking up the Beatles, blamed for her husband's death, extorted over and over again in his wake. If you feel that what I might enter into, even though all funds would be given to charity, is against your wishes, I would honor this completely. Sincerely, Mark David Chapman. Unbelievably, the man who murdered her husband right in front of her is asking for her cooperation in writing a book about the murder, from the murderer's point of view. Ellis's video is a lovingly crafted documentary about why these hateful rhetorics continue to swirl. It touched my heart, and I think it will touch yours too. So, what are you waiting for? Go to nebula.tv slash lilasebastian right now to get 40% off an annual subscription on me. Real quick before we continue, uh, this video was supposed to include segments with props and costumes and all that filmed in my favorite local community theater, North Portland's Twilight Theater Company. Unfortunately, the building it's in, I kid you not, was struck by a car and set on fire. But this year, the show was opening one week late after an accident that closed the building. Here's a look at the damage. A uh, day before Thanksgiving, a car crashed into our building and caught on fire, and then unfortunately caught the building on fire. Not on purpose, obviously, um, but the results have been really devastating for our community. If you can spare a donation, we'd love your support this holiday season. That's all. On with the show. I can't believe I'm telling you this, but I've had a couple drinks and oh my god. Art Pop is my favorite Lady Gaga album. That used to be a way more controversial opinion to have. It used to elicit a gasp or a disapproving stare from people I mentioned it to. Like, why on earth would you love Art Pop? But these days, Art Pop's reputation has recovered a bit. Not fully, but a bit. I'm gonna show cool live performances as much as possible in this video, but sometimes I have to show lyric videos because there's so little footage of her performing some of these songs, and even then they're often annoyingly abridged, you know, skipping verses and that sort of thing. Also, this era of lyric video makes me really nostalgic and I think it's fun. But we can't talk about art pop without first addressing Lady Gaga's meteoric rise to fame the years before. By 2013, Gaga was not a new phenomenon, but rather in a crucial phase of proving her staying power. It had been four years. She won over audiences and critics alike with The Fame, The Fame Monster, and Born This Way. Gaga took up the mantle of cultural provocateur for millennials during these early years. She thrived on controversy, abject imagery, and her celebration of subculture, particularly queer culture. In the time of I Kissed a Girl, here was a queer artist who had kissed girls. She spoke the language fluently. This is obvious in retrospect. We see Lady Gaga's tributes to Alexander McQueen today as maybe a little too on the nose. Her nods to drag culture, adorable, twee even, post RuPaul's Drag Race. But then, they were way more informed and intellectual than her contemporaries. And by the time Art Pop rolled around, Gaga was drowning in speculation over her personal life. Speculation that she dodged in interviews with quick wit and striking empathy. Someone said that um, uh, Lady Gaga is actually a very well endowed young man. <laughs> I think that might come from that thing. But I've seen photographs from stage, and if you're well endowed, I've got no idea where you're hiding it. Right. You know, but that is well, a... I do have a really big donkey dick. <laughs> There was that rumor where that, that you had a male appendage, that you were a hermaphrodite, and you, t you joked about it on the stage last night. Maybe I do. <laughs> but, but it's interesting. Would it be so terrible? But it's interesting. A lot of artists would immediately put out some sort of a statement saying, this is absolutely not true. You have fun with it. Why the hell am I going to waste my time and give a press release about whether or not I have a penis? My fans don't care, and neither do I. How do you deal with it? Do, are you with men more or women more? I do do you want to be married? What, what are you I thoughts? deal with it just fine. 
Um, well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking for love just like everyone else, Larry. You, you like the ladies and the gentlemen? Yes. OK. Uh, and are you seeing any ladies or gentlemen at the moment? Is there anyone special in your life? Well, you know I don't talk about my love life. No, but, I don't. Um, I'm very happy. So you're happy so you're seeing someone at the moment? I am happy. I am often questioned, how gay are you, Lady Gaga? And on a gay scale of 1 to 10, I'm a Judy Garland fucking 42. Talking to you over here. I'm listening. Yeah, well, your pervert ways don't quite equate to what God is all about. No? So My pervert to... ways? Yeah, you know, the homo stuff. The homo stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's gonna happen one day, darling. This is where I have to admit, for posterity, that these memories of early Gaga are hazy for me because I looked like this at the time. It's also worth mentioning that there is a video of me, dare I say, lost media, ooh, of a science project presentation in which I donned a blonde wig and Lady Gaga makeup to sing a parody of Poker Face about the anatomy of cells, which foreshadowed my life as an edutainment YouTuber, for sure. I emailed my friends from school who worked on the project with me. By some hilarious coincidence, we are still friends. They could not retrieve it. Every generation has artists that succeed from nothing but shock and hooks. They come, some last for a time, then they fade into various shades of obscurity. I'm gonna borrow for a second from Todd in the Shadows' video on Witness, Katy Perry's catastrophic 2017 flop, the album that is most often compared to art pop. For a while now, I've been workshopping this theory that there are two kinds of pop stars. First, there are the ones who are so compelling, so infused with that star quality and creativity that they'll always have that loyal core fan base to sustain them, waiting for the next record. And then there are the superstars who will be superstars for as long as the music is good. And if the bots stop coming for even a second, they're gone. This is what separates a Janet Jackson from a Paul Abdul, an Eminem from a Marilyn Manson. The weekend is probably the first kind, Bruno Mars is probably the second. In short, the answer is layers. It may be hard to conceive today that people thought Lady Gaga was not a culturally groundbreaking artist who could maintain longevity through her various iterations. Gaga had done nearly everything groundbreaking and controversial a pop star could do. She wore the meat dress. The moral and ethical and political implication of that outfit was far beyond what most people think, which is ew, <laughs> right? Ew. Her 2012 perfume, Fame, has notes of blood and semen in it, and I've been dying to get my hands on a bottle because they're, like, surprisingly hard to find. She hatched from an egg at the Grammys. It doesn't matter if you love him or capital H-I-N-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-M-
Let's use the Alejandro video as our benchmark for the rest of her shock value content. Whether or not the video is in good taste is not for me to say. I personally read it as a haunting reminder that fascism lurks just around the corner, even in times of social progress. One that arrived just before the Trump era, but I'm from none of the countries torn apart by these tragedies, and neither is Stephanie Germanata. So, needless to say, a star can only really run on shock for so long. Even the most avant-garde performance artists need to prove they have more to say than a magician. Like, sure, they can hold their breath for a long time, but they're not doing extreme sports. Gaga, in a stroke of precognitive brilliance, chose to do the whole... Can you see me? I mean, I know you can see me. But can you really see me? A full four years before Katy Perry. And that's what differentiates a Marina Abramovich from a Chris Angel. 2013 was the time. And I'll argue it made her today what Perry isn't. Gaga has always had a strong core fan base in The Little Monsters, but in world domination, one must conquer more than the people who already like you. As tides seemed to turn on Gaga's antics, she needed an album that was substantial. It had to be more than shocking. It needed to be experimental, vulnerable, intellectual, and tougher to swallow than a rosary. The problem was Gaga already had deconstructed her own fame in her first few albums. She had never actually been a vapid pop artist reliant on shock. Gaga chronicled her early fame period with a prolific pen and ample vulnerability. The fame and the fame monster being her first major releases. Gaga performed toxic relationships that were representative of more than just interpersonal drama. A major theme of Born This Way is Gaga's own Catholicism. She sang about struggling to find her faith in God through all the noise in a song she called Judas. Although I say this without a shred of irony, Judas is maybe the most plainly Christian song that's ever hit the Billboard Hot 100. It sounds like everything else I listened to in youth group at the time. Hang on, let me just... On Born This Way, Gaga name-dropped Jesus about 20 billion times. It doesn't matter if you love him or capital H-I-M. There's actually this really popular Ave Maria techno remix that became kind of a meme, and it sounds like a lot of what's on Born This Way. So, it's 2013, and fame is still a monster. We know Gaga has depth, but has anyone seen the girl underneath? Really seen her? I'm gonna play this for you guys. Okay. You think it's real? I think about this. I, I, it, it's a bad quality, but I don't know what I think about this. The art pop era officially began with the release of Aura, originally entitled Burka. Gaga wanted this song to be her lead single, Interscope said no. So Gaga made an account on her own fan website and leaked it. Uh, what? 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 That's what? Real. That is fucking real! That's Wait, real. What? That's really Barca. <laughs> oh fucking god! The backlash was immediate. Like we can and will shit talk record labels, but sometimes they have a point. Do you want to see the girl for lips behind the burger? 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 Behind Go to the church and ask God to forgive you. A white American woman releasing a song in which she portrays herself as a girl in a burqa and says, it's not a statement as much as just a move of passion is, you know, problematic. Sorry to burst your bubble, Gaga, but a white American woman choosing to wear a burqa is always a statement of some sort. Appearing in public in the following is offensive and alienating. But Lady Gaga was still a shock artist and she had a history of problematic appropriation, as the Alejandro anecdote illustrates. So I find myself wondering why this was the straw that broke the camel's back when it's probably the most nuanced she ever got while pulling a stunt like this. Okay, for example, I'll never understand how Born This Way was widely praised and adopted as an inclusivity anthem on a socially progressive album despite this lyric. No matter black, white, or base, or not, or, 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 Oops. 
Occidental Upload Group B4 is done giving orders around here. Your Lebanese, your Orient. No one is Orient made because the Orient does not exist except as an idea in the imagination of the Occident. The ones making people Orient made are the imperialist powers intent on oppressing those whom they've deemed the other. This is literally stated in the first chapter of Edward Said's Orientalism, which, by the way, is worth a read if you ever intend to be any kind of provocateur. Wrote Said, I have begun with the assumption that the Orient is not an inert fact of nature. It is not merely there, just as the Occident itself is not just there either. We must take seriously Vico's great observation that men make their own history, that what they can know is what they have made, and extend it to geography as both geographical and cultural entities, to say nothing of historical entities. Such locales, regions, geographical sectors as Orient and Occident are man-made. Therefore, as much as the West itself, the Orient is an idea that has a history and a tradition of thought, imagery, and vocabulary that have given it reality and presence in and for the West. The two geographical entities thus support and to an extent reflect each other. Okay, but the Glee performance has aged so poorly it shot the moon and is now absolutely hilarious and iconic. Nose? Brown eyes. Oh my god, where do I get that OCD shirt? My theory is that Gaga's history of cultural appropriation never struck a nerve this severely because she was never taken that seriously until she was. Whatever the case may be, the world was getting kind of sick of Gaga. Maybe the problem was never art pop, but rather residual resentment of born this way. Not everyone may have gotten the message behind the meat, but the constant costume changes help Lady Gaga maintain the public's curiosity. Now, I could seriously, seriously review born this way. I mean, I thought about it, I listened to it a bunch of times, I decided how I felt about every single track, and maybe I could talk about how all of Gaga's flash and image has basically slit its wrists, and then it bled into the music, completely drowning any chance of this being somewhat interesting. The album wasn't hated at the time, but just look at all the parodies that sprung up around it. They definitely indicate Gaga fatigue. I'll wrap my small intestines round my neck and set fire to myself on stage. I was once full of shit, now I think shit is full of me. Cheek freak, sister fierce. Actually, this one's pretty great. In Volula, a system of interplanetary plans, there were two races of humanoids, the bitchy dancers and the mucus heads. On the first day of the festival of the bleeding disco ball, Queen Cornerface decreed, from this day forth, the citizens of planet Fabulous shall only communicate via Madonna songs. The bitchy dancers protested, saying, wait, which Madonna songs? The mucus heads said nothing because they were mucus heads. And I mean, look at the promo material for this album. It's practically begging you not to listen to it. As she attempted to become a permanent cultural fixture, the time was now or never to make or break her. So her responses to current events of the year 2013 suddenly seemed a lot more important and a lot more tasteless. Aura is ostensibly a girl power anthem attempting to stand beside women oppressed by various bans on religious garments being proposed at the time. In France, for example, burqas were banned around the time Gaga wrote the album due to an alleged conflict between the secular state and Islam. This is a claim burqa wearing women have countered. A quick heads up, the woman interviewed here is wearing a niqab, not a burqa, but in France, both were banned at the same time and treated as interchangeable. Two months ago, Manu was fined for the first time. Jamais eu de problème avec la police et um... Là, vu que avec cette loi, j'enfreins la loi, je suis vraiment pris comme une criminelle. Et euh, ça fait mal, parce qu'on se dit que euh, juste le fait de se couvrir le visage, c'est euh, pris comme euh, 
être criminel. With the ban, how did it change how people re reacted to you? Donc euh, j'ai des réflexions, j'ai des insultes et euh, et voilà, c'est dommage que je ressemble à une sorcière, que je faisais peur aux gens, que c'était pas normal. Enfin, des insultes un peu plus poussées, mais euh, je préfère ne pas les mentionner. Many, in fact, see their garments as a powerful statement of choice, aligning themselves with God rather than any sort of government or regime. I can see how Lady Gaga, a controversial Catholic in her own right, might feel compelled by this metaphor. This is the position I think Gaga was trying to take. Spiritual women of the world, I see you, I hear you, I stand with you regardless of where you live or what you wear. But like I said, it's a botched metaphor. Many criticize the song for being mindlessly appropriative and sexualizing Muslim women, which is true. You Oh my god, it's so embarrassing. Religious garments like the burqa, hijab, and niqab have been long sexualized in Western popular culture. Muslim women have often been portrayed as sexual beings so powerful that they must be hidden away from sight. This perception infiltrates our popular imagination from a very young age, and is part of why Disney's Aladdin leaves a taste that is increasingly sour. I never realized how incredibly handsome you are. Try to imagine for a moment any other Disney princess using the powers of her seduction against the villain. Would Belle ever be put in this position? Say you'll marry me. I'm very sorry, Gaston, but... but... I just don't deserve you! Whoa! <laughs> Ariel even has her voice stolen and is explicitly told And don't underestimate the importance of a body language! <laughs> and yet gets a whole song dedicated to demurely trying to kiss her prince on a peaceful boat ride. Jasmine longs for freedom. Her symbols throughout the film are caged and uncaged birds. She is accompanied by a domesticated tiger. But she spends the film in various forms of sexualized bondage for the visual pleasure of an adult audience whom the film is not even made for. And then there's a phenomenon specific to pop stars laid bare by Lauren Michelle Jackson in her 2019 book, White Negroes When Corn Rows Were in Vogue, and Other Thoughts on Cultural Appropriation, in which white women entertainers culturally appropriate heavily in their quote unquote bad girl eras. Miley, Christina, Madonna, Taylor, Gwen, 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 Go to the church and ask God to forgive you. I've seen some arguments that Doja Cat is currently inverting this trope by having a bad girl era that props up white supremacists and anti-Semitism. This is because white women are innately infantilized, viewed by the world as innocent, chaste, and in need of protecting. So when conceptualizing themselves as girls gone bad, they adopt a persona rooted in blackness or orientalism or fetishization. The alleged purpose is that it provides texture. You know, that's why Christina Aguilera's dirty is called dirty. But although white women are painfully infantilized and often feel they'll never be taken seriously, they're also spared what Jackson refers to as the hellish matrix of racial violence. They are nonetheless caught up in the hellish matrix of sexual violence, so many respond by subjugating and appropriating from women of color in exchange for a quote-unquote more mature cultural currency. In many ways more restrictive than politics, pop culture holds firm to the idea that women can only be one thing, and America likes its white women chaste. While black girls are already grown before they hit puberty, white women must find creative ways to own that maturity for themselves. White pop stars, native to the industry as little girls and young women, need to go primitive to be sexual in ways whiteness doesn't afford. They too need to be changed. Both impulses, whether it's slaked by another individual or worn on the body, like a costume, inhabit colonial fantasies in a quote, concrete search for a real primitive paradise, says Hooks. Ethnicity, in this case, blackness by way of hip hop culture, become spice, seasoning that can liven up the dull dish that is the mainstream white culture. Ultimately, I'm, I'm torn on Aura because I think it had good intentions with poor execution, just like Born This Way, and Born This Way gets way too much leeway. And Aura is a better song than Born This Way. Gaga has always been an openly sexual pop star who has never really gone through a good girl era weaponizing her white fragility, and she's often inserted herself in hip hop spaces, a real mixed bag. While I don't think it's the place of any white Catholic American to become the torchbearer for Muslim women internationally, especially if they're the kind of white feminist who says things like Orient made 
The song's intent often goes mysteriously unremarked. Intent does not forgive execution, obviously, yet it's worth remarking that Aura is distinct from Gaga's previous incidents of cultural appropriation and that it was trying to be informed and stand beside marginalized women. Aura is compared frequently to Gwen Stefani's posse of Harajuku girls or Christina Aguilera singing that she's a genie in a bottle, when a more apt comparison might be Shakira on Waka Waka. We're all Africa. And Aura is far from Gaga's sole instance of cultural appropriation on this album. It's just the one she didn't get away with. On this note, many little monsters seem to think this song, the title of which is an ethnic slur by the way, so I'm just gonna call it G word, saves the album from being a total flop. And I could not disagree more. At least Aura is an attempt at sisterhood and third worldism. G word is just laughable. Sometimes I think that we could just be friends. Cause I'm a wandering man, he said to me I don't know if you would listen to a gypsy's prayer I'm going to quote my girlfriend real quick who is a Romani activist for a second here. Americans seem to think being a gypsy is a profession. It's a heritage. This song does the whole, wow, gypsy means free and nomadic. I wonder why they're nomadic. Must be because they're just so free thing which is a tired anti-Zygonist trope that's so common. It's just quite funny to me, especially with the amount of emotion she puts in. Feels like a Key and Peele sketch. And if you're wondering how Gaga responded to this criticism, well, she didn't respond well. Go to the church and ask God to forgive you. Gaga, in particular, carries a really pernicious cultural myth on her person. This idea that anyone from anywhere can make it by simply being themselves. But being yourself and being culturally appropriative are not compatible artistic decisions. A white girl in cornrows is wearing a costume, borrowed and returned. But as for me, and I'm sure this is true with many other listeners, I was introduced to art pop through the album version of this song. I wasn't on Twitter at the time, I wasn't really tuned into pop music on social media in general. For years I had no idea it was subject to any controversy or criticism, and never had associated it with Islam. You can blame that on my ignorance, but I always interpreted it solely as a song about Gaga grappling with her persona, which it is. When the half-baked burqa metaphor was basically tossed for the studio version, This is an aura. This is your aura. It's very young. An aura is a unique representation of your existence in the art pop universe. It will grow and change over time as you travel through the app, discovering new things, creating new projects, and meeting new auras, both alike and the same. What's left is a song that somehow manages to deconstruct fame better than the two previous albums. I regret to report, it's a hell of an opener. There are two poetic devices here I find particularly strong. One, I'm a sucker for precise placement of the word and. I killed my former and. The use of and placed at the start of a poem stands at where central idea implies text that stretches before or after the limits of, well, the text. It feels like we are dropped into the middle of something, even if that something that comes before or after doesn't actually exist. Instead of singing, I killed my former and left her in the trunk on Highway 10, Gaga sings for the album's opening line, I killed my former and. It's like we're being let in on a story just as it comes to its thrilling conclusion. In just one short line, she signifies both the end and beginning of a narrative arc. Two being the ambiguity of the word it. Put the knife under the hood. If you find it, send it straight to Hollywood. Her former self is dead, but the it she wants to send to Hollywood remains unknown. What or who is this it? The knife? The trunk? The hood? Perhaps even her former self? Gaga's Swinefest performance features her stabbing a knife into the stage, which I guess implies that the knife is the object in question. But I always took this line to mean this. If you find the person Gaga used to be, send her to Hollywood because that's where she is currently having lost herself. After all, Highway 10, where she killed her former and left her body, ends in Los Angeles. So right off the bat, Gaga has answered that pressing question, how can she possibly deconstruct her own fame when that's what her very first projects were about? Easily. Those albums were about Gaga. This one is about Stephanie. Lady Gaga is the veil, the aura, the costumes she wears are a form of semi-transparent expression and cowardice. 
But beneath the curtain is Stephanie, an aching and vulnerable human seen by few, if any. So the lover the song is addressed to might be an intimate partner, the one person she's letting in, but it might also be Gaga's audience. This is the album's thesis. Art Pop aims to distinguish Lady Gaga from Stephanie. We are to be shown Stephanie if we look close enough. So what is there to see? Who is the real Stephanie Germanata beneath the costumes, beneath the appropriation, beneath the face paint? Mama, what's the matter? Didn't you never see a naked chick riding a clam before? Part of what came to distinguish Lady Gaga from more basic shock artists at the time was the idea of her being highbrow. What's up with this Gaga dude? He just like dresses weird, right? Like Bowie? <gasps> Lady Gaga is a woman. She's only the biggest pop act to come along in decades. She's boundary pushing, the most theatrical performer of our generation. And she changes her look faster than Brit changes sexual partners. That's true. Which is a very awkward position to be put in for a pop artist. The idea that you're only socially acceptable because you're so much better than all of your peers, according to some arbitrary standard of propriety. I can only imagine that's a lonely position to be put in, especially when you're a woman who loves art because art doesn't really love you back. For all women who love quote unquote higher classical art, myself included, there is an underlying tension, especially when we self-identify with men, but the world identifies us with women. Any view of the past is, by nature, distorted and imperfect. But there's distortion by accidental omission, there's distortion for political purposes, and then there's distortion by assumption. It's not just that a statement like, the Louvre doesn't have any art by women, which can easily be disproven, allows others to drag out the canard of, oh, feminism is all about exaggeration. It's that this sort of thing helps hide the achievements of women. It contributes to the myth that women didn't paint in the Renaissance. Several women actually had highly successful careers as portrait painters. It contributes to the myth that women were illiterate, that women have traditionally always worked at home and only entered the workplace in the 1960s and later, and so on. It contributes to the myth that tapestries depicting war must have been designed and created by men, even when documentary evidence for the Bayo tapestry, to name just one example, says otherwise, and contributes to the myth that art focused on traditionally male interests must have been created by men. We have faced enough real historical subjugation without adding to it. We love art, but we also recognize that most women are not featured as artists in museums, but rather as the art itself. Tasteful reclining nude paintings, carefully posed sculptures of naked women with idealized proportions. Even to this day, only about 5-10% to of all art in the Louvre is attributed to women. Granted, that doesn't mean that 5-10% to of art in the Louvre was made by women, but the rest fall under the attribution of anonymous, which, in a culture that venerates so-called singular geniuses, means that these anonymous female artisans are often left overlooked and their stories untold. For the album's cover art and one of its main motifs, Gaga adopted the birth of Venus. The painting is often interpreted to be about the conflict between aesthetic and intellectual love. Venus standing between those two aspects represents that the divine can only be truly seen when both are acknowledged. That is the rarest Gaga of them all, the Gaga Venus de Milo, carved by Gaga artisans who work exclusively in the medium of Gaga. Will you two stop saying Gaga so much? Venus. Gaga commissioned the ever controversial Jeff Koons to slash the birth of Venus to bits and place Lady Gaga as a plasticine sculpture beside one of his famous gazing balls, a series originally inspired by lawn ornaments he saw in his Pennsylvanian hometown. Kunz himself is a king of pop and controversy, a deeply contentious artist. Although most of his work is made, you know, not by him actually. Critics have always been divided on whether his work counts as daring kitsch in high art spaces or commercial nonsense for the highest bidder. Is he a Warhol or a Kincaid? That's your decision. And if you're like, hey, what's wrong with Thomas Kincaid? That's where you stand. Gaga first breached this topic on Born This Way on the recently popularized Bloody Mary. We are not just art for Michelangelo to carve. He can't rewrite the egg rule of my fury heart. I think this track helps the two albums flow pretty cohesively into each other. The first song Gaga wrote for Art Pop was also, surprise, surprise, Venus. It's clear Botticelli's painting became one of her main inspirations, and its imagery can be seen throughout Gaga's promotion for the album. Gaga 
Venus is a campy number, but if you allow yourself to get into the headspace and blast off with rocket number 9, it can also be transcendent as fuck. And while this has never officially been said by Gaga or Interscope, at least to my knowledge, I think part of why the song was shelved is that it is queer. <laughs> So Venus is the goddess of love and a planet, so you've got this Greek mythology slash solar system vibe going on, but while listening, I can't help but remember the fact that Temple of Venus was one of the Marquis de Sade's preferred term for the vagina. Talk about figures who leave us in the lurch when it comes to declaring them art or pop. But yeah, Venus is explicitly addressed to Venus, whether you take that to be a woman or her vagina. Venus! Venus. This is a partner with whom Gaga experiences dying just a little. When you touch me, I die just a little inside. Oh, wonder if this could be love, this could be love. With the help of some aphrodisiacs, of course. Let's not forget that Venus and Aphrodite are pretty much the same goddess. So an aphrodisiac is a venesiac. Have a nice baby, it's aphrodisiac. lazy. Venus. I love this song. It's giving Space Mountain Slaughterhouse 5 queer temporality. It takes the setting of ballroom and turns it into an intergalactic showcase. It's like a transcendent lesbianic interplanet Janet. Neptune. Go. Now sir. Pluto. Saturn. Jupiter. Mercury. Venus. Oh. You know my ass is famous. I am obligated to point out that this performance of Venus has her donning a Damien Gillet-esque gown. You may recognize his costumes and choreography from 2018 Suspiria, but I think at this time he was best known for Les Medusas, a dance that took place in the Louvre in 2013 while art pop was being created. In French, être médusé means literally to be paralyzed by stupefaction. It involves the notion of gaze, and is one of the rare verbs to be directly derived from a myth, and in this case, the myth of Medusa. The Gorgon can transform through her eyes any living being who crosses her into stone. It's by exploring this dynamic of where roles of observing and being observed intersect, where the qualities of the living and the petrified are reversed, that Jalay responded to the invitation in 2013 from the Louvre Museum to create a choreographic parkour in the sculpture rooms. Again, in an era where positive gay representation was most widely considered to be found on Glee, Gaga delivered us a celestial Paris is burning. People didn't get it. But the queer themes in Greek mythology references don't end there, so hang on to your wigs. Guy is a song about power bottoming. It's Lady Gaga's least successful single of all time, and the critical response was very confused. Probably because I cannot stress this enough, it's a queer song about power bottoming that came out in 2013. Guy also saw the release of a massive 11 minute long multi-song music video that for me forever and ever solidified my love for this messy, provocative little album. Everything about this video is just so absurd, contrasting camp and opulence with lowbrow humor and luxury. We've got Jesus, MJ, and Gandhi, Lego brick art, Andy Cohen as Zeus raining down upon the synchronized swimmers. <laughs> This video just makes me smile, and it helped shape my aesthetic inclinations for sure. I'm gonna talk a bit more about it later in depth. All this to say, Guy plays with gender roles and art pomp does generally. Especially a later song on the album, Manicure. Man, I cure. Man cure. Get it? Everybody, please clap. I'm so sorry. I forgot to get a pedicure, but instead I got a manicure! But Guy will always have a special place in my heart. When Gaga sings, Sure, she's singing about how she doesn't care if she charts, but she's also singing about the strap, biological or otherwise, and I am but a simple twink. If loving Guy is a crime, then I am a convicted criminal of thought. Speaking of. There is a third explicitly queer song in a row, and sorry, it's another perfect song. Sex Dreams, spelled with three X's, is a song about how Lady Gaga hears her boyfriend is away this weekend and wants to know if he'd like to meet at her place. I 
I know it's potentially annoying when I point out that everything is gay as if that makes it automatically good and you know, I try not to do that, but in this case I, I can't help but think of her. She found this representation particularly meaningful when she was listening to it back in the day, and I love that for her. People keep commenting to tell me that they just realized they aren't subscribed despite being fans, so I'm just popping on real quick to say, hey, don't forget to subscribe, but it helps me out immensely, seriously. That's all, back to the video. So at the start of the guy video, there's this gang of roving capitalists consumed by plucking money from the ground after they've shot a winged woman, Lady Gaga, out of the sky. The fallen angel bird, etc., attempts to pull herself up, stumbling before falling, eventually crawling to the gates of Hearst Castle. Here, she is carried off by the gays, adorned in flowers, and baptized slash resurrected by the real housewives of Beverly Hills. Oh my god, somebody please get that cello away from Yolanda Foster. <laughs> a bow should not be sawed on a fingerboard. This sequence is juxtaposed with music from Art Pop, the eponymous song, not the album, which serves itself as the album's philosophical manifesto. It's a song about how art pop can mean anything because it's a hybrid of art and pop. Stronger together, no matter how fragile it looks. This is probably also a good time to talk about poptimism, which Lady Gaga champions on the album. A critical movement asserting that pop music deserves the same respect music journalists and other industry professionals afford to other genres. Specifically, rock. Khalifa Sane, who wrote the ultimate piece on what journalists call rockism, made some excellent points in 2004 that many consider to have launched poptimism into music journalism's mainstream consciousness. A rockist isn't just someone who loves rock and roll, who goes on and on about Bruce Springsteen, who champions ragged voice singer-songwriters no one has ever heard of. A rockist is someone who reduces rock and roll to a caricature, then uses that caricature as a weapon. Rockism means idolizing the authentic old legend or underground hero while mocking the latest pop star, lionizing punk while barely tolerating disco, loving the live show and hating the music video, extolling the growling performer while hating the lip syncer. Countless critics assail pop stars for not being rock and roll enough, without stopping to wonder why that should be everybody's goal, or they reward them disproportionately for making rock and roll gestures. Poptimism as a reaction to rockism often cites misogyny and racism within the music industry and its fandom generally. Why is it, for example, that every Radiohead album gets to be an instant classic while Gaga has been for much of her career relegated to the realm of guilty pleasure? Well, it has to do with the roots of prejudices within music, the anti-black sentiments, for example, behind the backlash against disco. Rockism isn't unrelated to older, more familiar prejudices. That's part of why it's so powerful, and so worth arguing about. The pop star, the disco diva, the awesomely bad hit maker. Could it really be a coincidence that raucous complaints often pit straight white men against the rest of the world? Like the anti-disco backlash of 25 years ago, the current raucous consensus seems to reflect not just an idea of how music should be made, but also an idea about who should be making it. I was a young raucous to myself between the ages of 10 and 13 before I woke up one day and began to realize some simple facts about life. For one, rock was for decades a catch-all label used to establish essentially the western canon of music. You know me, I'm about as classics positive as a person can be. I will always love many of Rock's most fundamental albums, but being a girl with a bass guitar was seriously disenchanting. I was obsessed with prog rock. I saved up months of allowances to get my first guitar from a pawn shop, but as I learned and grew as a girl in rock music, I began to realize that everyone was talking down to me, not because of my lack of skill or anything, but because of my gender. If you want to know why so many women and people of color avoid rock spaces or lose their enthusiasm for music after being in them, it's because there's always some patronizing asshole trying to tell you that you're a disappointment for not liking all of the same things that he likes. Or, you know, some misguided salesman who's like, wow, are you playing Rush in Guitar Center? You're like, what, 12? And it's like, 12 is the correct age to play Rush in a Guitar Center. <laughs> Shout out to all the shitty guys who would say things to me like, wow, it's such a shame you like Lana Del Rey more than actual music. I'm assigning you this album by Neutral Milk Hotel so you can learn to appreciate lo-fi production. <laughs> Notice how those tributes to women who rock sneakily transform rock from a genre to a verb to a catch-all term of praise. Ever wonder why Outkast and The Roots and Most Def and The Beastie Boys get taken so much more seriously than other rappers? Maybe because rockist critics love it when hip-hop acts impersonate rock and roll bands. 
A recent Rolling Stone review praised the Beastie Boys for scruffily resisting the gold-plated fooey currently passing for Gangsta. Two weeks ago, in the New York Times book review, Sarah Vowell approvingly recalled Nirvana's rise, a group with loud guitars and louder drums knocking the whimpering Mariah Carey off the top of the charts. Why did the changing of the guard sound so much like a sexual assault? And when did we all agree that Nirvana's neo-punk was more respectable than Miss Carey's neo-disco? Rockism is imperial. It claims the entire musical world as its own. Rock and roll is the unmarked section in the record store, a vague pop music category that swallows all the others. If you write about music, you're presumed to be a rock critic. There's a place in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for doo-wop groups and folk singers and disco queens and even rappers, just so long as they, you know, rock. Rock music has not remained popular despite most music journalists being ostensibly rock-oriented. It's just remained a safe space for white dudes who want rock music to be by and for white dudes. And I guess all I can say is get over it, snowflake. <laughs> Rock music was never yours, and if you are intimidated by a 5'1 Pink Floyd enthusiast, I suggest you go cry about it because that's actually hilarious. I recognize that music criticism has been for a long time ruled by anti-black homophobic misogynistic sentiments, and I have reservations about poptimism. Especially since in the decade between art pop and now, stan culture has become the norm, and it's probably a worse thing for music than rockism. Probably. For starters, the idea that pop music is the music of the oppressed is kind of laughable. Its explicit purpose is to appeal to as wide a range of people as possible, not to speak truth to power. While pop music's vapidity has been greatly exaggerated, the majority of pop music is not challenging. And you know, it's not meant to be. But I think it's important to acknowledge that pop figureheads have, like rockers, covered up a slew of industry abuses. Pop music serves to establish and perpetuate cultural hegemonies, and in most cases, actively avoids being political. Pop music is conspicuous in its consumption, and frankly, no artist should be above criticism. Taylor Swift and Beyonce are not underdogs in this world. All of these people are privy to mountains of corporate resources. So like, can art pop mean anything? I mean, it could. I don't personally believe there's just one interpretation that's valid of any piece of great art. It's gonna mean something different to everyone who connects with it. Gaga sings about being flown on beaches for public sight, AKA Hollywood fakes everything, even relationships. Love is kind. I think we're being asked to find our own truth through the acknowledgement that pop is artificial. After all, you can't spell artifice without art. But was the idea successfully conveyed to and accepted by the masses of 2013? Definitely not. If anything, I think one of the main reasons art pop suffered in charts and rock publications is because of anti-intellectualism. Lady Gaga tried to combine highbrow and lowbrow, but I think despite her efforts to get pop stands excited about the Abramovich method, she greatly underestimated just how much people hate art. Tonight we put art in the front of all things. We embark on a ritual dance of creative rebellion. I think it's nice to receive things with your mind as a blank canvas. A celebration, something that took all my mess and all my pain that the point is that we receive as a blank canvas that and turned it into the most beautiful schizophrenic psychedelic dance when you hear something you allow the art kind of to be made for the first time in a way full of color loud electronic music the most outrageous fashion something nearly impossible to follow like my heart like my mind a runaway train. A Seriously, I hate to say it, but if writing these essays has taught me anything, it's just that most people don't like to learn or be challenged. Especially not by pop stars. Any pop project with even a splash of intellect is going to be called pretentious or demonic or shouted down by a vocal minority. So when Gaga started tweeting about having a personal artistic discipline reawakened by meditation and counting rice, of course the internet was hostile. Apparently, it is pretentious for an artist to care about art. <laughs> And I guess one thing we can't forget is that art doesn't love Gaga either. The birth of Venus may represent conflict between the aesthetic and intellectual callings, but it's also a nude. 
It's a painting of a naked lady who was, for her time, considered the beauty standard. Like, remember when Kim Kardashian broke the internet with her butt? No, wait, come back. <laughs> Twas the era, seriously. So, Gaga takes Venus and throws a seashell bikini on top. Or the Muppets. And that's the thing about the Muppets. Sometimes it's easy to forget that there's a human body inside of that pig. And all the little piggies in here will go wee 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 Straightforward rape or abduction is more typical of deities than shape changing for sexual advantage. Thus Poseidon ravished the maiden Canis as she strolled along the seashore. When he thereafter offered to grant her any wish, she chose to become a man so she could never again be raped. There is a theme of abuse and sexual misconduct running throughout art pop. The industry abuses her, the men in the industry abuse her, and apparently so did an ex of hers. Perhaps most notably, the fame itself is abusive. The fame monster is alive and well, but backgrounded. Art Pop's tone shifts during the song Sex Dreams. Sex Dreams is where themes of queerness and abuse finally intertwine, and don't untangle for the rest of the album. If you thought you were here for a fun, sexy dance party, this is when Gaga pulls the rug. Perhaps this is a source of discontent for many listeners. While Venus and Guy remain upbeat, Sex Dreams becomes more of a hushed confession interrupted by an increasingly desperate call for help. help me. If Gaga's first verse is a confession, the song's second verse alludes to the consequences should our two lovers be caught in the act. Reference is made to the fact that Gaga was broken by the one before. This is also the introduction, in my humble opinion, of the album's Medusa motif. You could turn to stone all the color of and petrify by a woman. Which carries through in constant references to Versace. Versace promises I will dolce vita. Medusa is Versace's chosen mascot, a rape victim with snakes for hair whose very gaze can turn you to stone. Medusa is the protagonist of one of the most popular stories from Greek mythology. Medusa was a loyal woman who spent her youth dedicated not to a god, but a goddess, Athena, who she believed was the strongest of all the Olympians. And in return, Athena respected Medusa as a beautiful woman who chose a female goddess instead of any man. However, one of the greatest feuds in all of Olympus was about to be taken Medusa's story in a dramatically different direction. The rivalry between Athena, goddess of wisdom and war, and Poseidon, god of the sea, ruined many lives. As Medusa entered the Parthenon, she was awed by the powerful beauty of such a monument. The temple, filled with great works of art, was tribute to the goddess Athena for protecting and inspiring the city. Yet, it was there that Poseidon forced himself on Medusa, wrongfully claiming her as his partner forever. The goddess Athena couldn't bear to watch. Poseidon's plan was in fact to humiliate Athena, and he indeed succeeded to do so. Taken by jealousy for Medusa having surrendered to her greatest rival, instead of supporting the victim of this horrible violence, she punished her. Using divine power, she changed Medusa's hair to hard serpents. She cursed Medusa with the legs of a bird and matching giant metal wings. Even you, Medusa, should you seek your reflection, shall turn to rock the instant you see your face, Athena said. And for the record, despite the album's Venus imagery, Gaga is actually most often positioned as a Medusa pining after a Venus. She fears throughout the album that her adoration of Venus can never be enough for a literal goddess of love. And how could it? Especially when she's been turned into, dare I say, Mother Monster. Likely to fail in their lustful aims are monstrous beings who inspire to a sexual encounter or a marital relationship with a non-monstrous being, especially with a lovely goddess. The huge Tidios, a son of Gaia, attempted to assault Leto as she was traveling to Pytho. As a result, he now lies tormented in a rebos, where vultures continually peck at his liver. Mary Jane Holland as well, I might argue, has Hellenistic references alluding to sexual assault, specifically Apollo and Daphne. 
Thus, Apollo fell in love with the nymph Daphne and pursued her, but she fled from him, having no interest in any suitors. In order to avoid losing her virginity, she prayed to her father, the river god Peneus, to change her shape into something else, and he assented, turning her into a laurel tree, whereupon Apollo declared that if Daphne would not be his wife, then at least the laurel would be his special tree. So if you have fear, Apollo, sit on my lair and the song is about trees. Well, Okay, it's about marijuana, but marijuana is presented therein as one of the vices we adopt in order to get over the trauma of the past and just have a good time. Much like Russian hookers and cheap gin. Daphne's story is part of the genre of the pursuit myth, one of many aggressive rape fantasies gods attempt to inflict upon humans. These stories usually end in the transformation of the beloved, usually a nymph into a part of nature. Pan once pursued the Arcadian Hamadryad Syrinx with erotic intent, and she fled, escaping him by transformation into reeds, which Pan bound together, creating a pipe a special musical instrument. So if Gaga is Daphne attempting to outrun her abuser through the trees, when she smokes trees, the gods take pity on her and transform her into someone who can sprout anew and forget about her worries. She's able to go from a blonde to a brunette. When I the flame and put you in my mouth, the grass eats up But this abuse theme is most directly addressed on Swine, a raucous EDM banger dropped right in the middle of the album. It's probably the most aggressive and disgusting Gaga has ever gotten. This line in particular, let's just say it refers to more than Gaga's pirouette behind a veil motif. This song clearly meant a lot to Gaga. It was heavily marketed and, duh, became the reason that what was supposed to be one of her biggest shows of the era was named Swinefest. Well, that and pigs are an iconic rock music motif, and if one has to bridge the gap between rockism and poptimism to make the ultimate art pop album, she couldn't have picked a better symbol than pigs. I don't know why music critics at the time, like, completely ignored this. <laughs> Reading through contemporaneous reviews, I saw very few references to the likes of Pink Floyd or Nine Inch Nails. I can't read every review in existence, granted, but I read quite a few, and I didn't see rock critics mention it. So I'm gonna be the critic to talk about it in depth, because art pop is clearly inspired by both artists. In George Orwell's Animal Farm, Pink Floyd's inspiration for animals, pigs are the abusers of power. Animal Farm is about the flaws in communist regimes and why they devolve into totalitarianism. It's about how people in charge love to take advantage of those beneath them, and so is Pink Floyd's animals. In the downward spiral, pigs are the motif often used by Trent Reznor slash Nine Inch Nails to signify fakers and phonies, including within the group itself. Nothing's turning out the way I'm Reznor himself was inspired by Pink Floyd, and he became fascinated with the Manson family murders at his lowest point, even moving into 150 Cielo Drive in 1992. The words Le Pig had been written in Sharon Tate's blood by her murderers, and that's what Trent named his studio, Le Pig. I've also been politely reminded by my co-writer that Motley Crue's 1997 album Generation Swine, a Hunter S. Thompson reference no less, is the album widely considered to have killed the band, and by some, also rock music, which is probably worth a mention when it comes to the history of rock music and pig motifs. Swine is not a marketable song. I mean, 
Neither is closer, but alt-rock stars of the 90s got way more leeway than pop stars of the 2010s. And also, closer isn't really about sex, and neither is swine. I get how it received this reputation as like a sex jam, but as an OCD haver, I can't help but find it a painful listen reserved for like 3am existential crises. Swine is the same animal. The swine fest is not a fun rave to be at. It's not fun and cool to act like a swine. It's pathetic and embarrassing. Context established, pigs are often used to signify abusers in narratives about mental health spirals. Clearly, art pop is no exception. Gaga has sort of inverse boundaries. She won't tell you, for example, where she just went on vacation, but she's totally open about having been sexually assaulted when she was a teenager. Swine is in conversation with and juxtaposed by Dope. And if I could change anything about this album, I'd let them live right next to each other. Kind of like how Reptile turns into the eponymous downward spiral. Dope is the quiet, reflective moment near the end of the album that makes you go, wait a second, am I crying? Why am I crying? It's a song most considered to be about the addictions Gaga developed after her traumatic hip surgery. One of the hardest things that I ever had to give up was drugs and alcohol. And I still have a real hard time with it. But I wanted to say something about it tonight. Because I've watched too many great artists and too many friends go because of those two things. And I want tonight so badly to be a change. I do not have to be high to be creative. I do not have to be drunk to have a good idea. While I'm sure that's true, I think some missing context is that Gaga was also dealing with chronic fibromyalgia pain at this time. In 2017, Gaga revealed that she suffers from nerve pain, which she believes stems from sexual assault. She's also spoken candidly in recent years about how traumatic her rise to fame was in the wake of her sexual assault. And if you know anything about PTSD, you'll know that these pains are not so neatly compartmentalized. I developed PTSD as a result of being raped and also not processing that trauma. I all of a sudden became a star and was traveling the world, going from hotel room to garage to limo to stage, and I never dealt with it. And then all of a sudden, I started to experience this incredible, intense pain throughout my entire body that mimicked the illness I felt after I was raped. This live version of Dope, documented by Spike Jones, that Spike Jones, is incredible and heartbreaking. Her face is bare, she's sobbing in her seat, and the song is not performed with perfect precision but it's absolutely and totally real. Critics didn't respond positively to Dope. I think it's a shame that it took nearly a decade for the song to become the classic it has outside of the insular monsters. Gaga's fans have always loved this song with a passion and seem to understand what it's about, just another reason to love them. But honestly, no context is necessary to hear that this song is raw, vulnerable, and heartfelt. But you know, as a survivor of sexual assault who struggles with PTSD and chronic illness, I know all too well that my visceral pain and its expressions have often been similarly received as histrionics. Listen, celebrities, and pop stars especially, do a lot of publicity stunts to garner some sort of public sympathy or create spectacle. But the scorn Gaga faced in this era for being an emotional human being, I'll never understand. Artists are acutely sensitive. 
You can't criticize pop stars for being fake and then say it's cringe when they're vulnerable. This is just another reason I think art pop makes people uncomfortable. It's outwardly emotional in a messy, embarrassing way. Indies and rockers, they can show up to a performance in tears and talk about how hard it's been to quit drugs, but when Lady Gaga let her guard down, the world asked her to put it back up. Is that really fair to ask of anyone? That's probably the thing about this album's story that most makes me want to scream. Well, okay, there is another thing that makes me want to scream. Art Cop, the new album from Lady Gaga. And do what you want, featuring R. Kelly. Art Pop, available November 11th. And the new single, Do What You Want. Lady Gaga, Art Pop, the album, out now. Yes, I'm a dog. So no, I can't sing. But there is always a song in my heart. Can you hear it? Closer. Art Pop has one fundamental flaw, and it's not just the inclusion and later exclusion of an R. Kelly duet. Do What You Want, in my humble opinion, is the thematic center of the album, but it was so controversial it had to be removed. You probably know this, but R. Kelly is a convicted sex offender. After decades of sexual misconduct allegations, tonight, a federal judge in Brooklyn sentenced singer and convicted sexual predator R. Kelly to 30 years in prison. This is a significant outcome for all victims of R. Kelly, and especially for the survivors who so bravely testified about the horrific and sadistic abuse they endured. The one-time music superstar faced life behind bars after a jury found him guilty in federal court on one count of racketeering and eight counts of sex trafficking. Tonight, one of Kelly's accusers relieved. I never thought that I would be here to see him be held accountable for the atrocious things that he did to children. According to Judge Ann Donnelly, who presided over Kelly's 2021 trial, He used his fame and organization to lure young people into abusive sexual relationships, a racketeering enterprise the government alleged spanned about 25 years. A lot of people excuse this collaboration, saying shit like, she didn't know any better, or what do you expect from a shock artist, and I'm not gonna do that. The irony of R. Kelly singing Do What I Want With Your Body, given the weight of the allegations already very present at that time, insanity. I could be the drink in your cup. I could be the green in your blunt, your pusherman. Yeah, I got what you want. You want to escape. And she said she was held against her will for days, and then he raped her after she became unconscious in 2003. She's being identified under the name Sonia. She said she was 21 years old. She met R. Kelly at a mall in Utah. She was interning at a radio station at the time. And she thought her first huge celebrity interview would kickstart her career. So he invited her to his studio in Chicago to interview him. They ended up locking her in a room. She asked for food. She was given Chinese food and immediately became extremely full and sleepy when she woke up. She said she saw R. Kelly doing up his pants in the corner and felt some wet stuff in between her legs. Slowly but surely, you know, he started to get into, okay, you can only wear sweats. Okay, you have to knock any and every single time you come out of this room. Okay, you need to delete every single person in your phone except for my four phone numbers. Okay, you have to stop doing this. Okay, you can't do this anymore. If you don't listen, then we're going to get into, you know, beatings and, and chastising and, you know, this is to help you. This and is it to, did get into beatings. It did. it did. Yeah, it did. And, you know, it was always, you know, this is to better you. You can see into the bathroom. It's clear. And she said she saw bruises all over Asriel's body. So I told my husband, yes, we're flying up there, like, book us a ticket. It was no more tickets for that day, so we came the next day. And what we did not know is... He, he do his own makeup on the girls to cover their bruises. We found this so out So when later. he knew we was coming, he must have uh, put makeup on Asriel, and that's why she was comfortable to show us because I didn't see But she showed us bruises. her arms and stuff like we didn't look here, and then we found out later from other inside people that normally he don't bruise them up on their face or their arms. He hit them on their side or their, on their, side or their butt. And, stuff and my like daughter that. has said it was bruises all over her. Do what I want. Do what I want with your body. Do what I want, do what I want with your body. Back of the club, taking shots, getting naughty. No invitations, it's a private party. But also, there's no way Gaga didn't know. And I think her decision to include him in this duet was pointed and deliberate given the album's subject matter. Let me explain. 
Gaga has claimed the inspiration for Do What You Want came first from her rage against what she calls shallow journalism, mainly comments about her weight instead of her music, especially since in 2012, she revealed that she had long struggled with disordered eating. Bulimia and anorexia since I was 15. But today, I join the body revolution to inspire bravery and breed some motherfucking compassion. The art pop era had a puke performance scandal, by the way. Uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna show it. Gaga's South by Southwest 2014 performance, hilariously sponsored by Doritos of all companies, Lady Gaga, live at the Doritos Bowl stage, saw her thrown up all over by Millie Brown, a vomit artist not to be confused with the Stranger Things star. At the time, there was Twitter uproar, shocker. Demi Lovato, for example, tweeted her disgust, saying the performance was, quote, glamorizing eating disorders. This is a great example of why we should maybe not dogpile on people via social media without knowing much about their personal lives. It never hurts to give the benefit of the doubt. Not everybody's going to love that performance. She's the artist. Yes, yeah. Millie Brown. Uh, but we both really believe in uh, artistic expression and strong identities, and I support her and what she does. And Art Pop, my new album, is about bringing art and music together in the spirit of creative rebellion. And for us, that performance was art in its purest form. But we totally understand that some people won't be into it. At the time of Do What You Want, Kelly was an alleged sex offender. Those allegations were widely known. In 1994, he married then 15-year-old Alia in an illegal ceremony. Accusations of child pornography and molestation surfaced and resurfaced in 1996, 2000, 2002, and 2009. By 2013, Kelly was already a controversial figure whose popularity had mostly faded. So, why him? Why would Gaga choose to record a duet with R. Kelly on an album that addresses a history of abuse and sexual assault? I've been living in Chicago and spending a lot of time there, and that's where R. Kelly hails from. This is a real R&B song, and I said, I have to call the king of R&B and I need his blessing. It was a mutual love. Do What You Want was not supposed to be a single. Gaga had promised Venus, but because of Do What You Want's viral popularity, Gaga, or perhaps Interscope, probably Interscope, maybe both, decided to release it instead of Venus. Gaga was photographed for Do What You Want's cover art by the ever-controversial Terry Richardson, who, like R. Kelly, is an enormous pop culture figure accused of sexual misconduct since the early 2000s. Starting to see a pattern here, no? Many interviewers quelp today about my shocking performance with R. Kelly on SNL. I'm beginning to think y'all aren't ready for the video. But much like the music video for Venus was scrapped, Richardson's Do What You Want video has never been released. To this day, it is partially lost media fans have been attempting to reconstruct since. December 4th, 2013, Gaga hopped on Twitter to say she was intent on making the video perfect, calling it very personal. And then nothing. Surprise, surprise, collaborating with a bunch of known sexual predators does not a popular album make, even in 2013. Gaga and Kelly's performance at the AMAs had all this weird power imbalance imagery too, with Kelly playing President of the United States and Gaga his secretary. At one point, they even pantomimed fellatio, an obvious Monica Lewinsky invocation. I would show this performance um, here, but YouTube said absolutely not, so. Post Me Too, all of this reads very differently than it did upon release. Well, not to me, but certainly to a lot of people. In 2014, for example, Lewinsky broke her silence and re-emerged in the public eye to talk about the immense shame and humiliation she experienced when thrust into it. I was branded as a tramp, tart, slut, whore, bimbo, and of course, that woman. I was seen by many, but actually known by few. And I get it. It was easy to forget that that woman was dimensional, had a soul, and was once unbroken. I'm broken. So why do people who've been abused continue to work with abusers? Why did Taylor Swift, who has written songs about feeling sexually violated by an older man at 19 years old, appear in a film by David O. Russell, who allegedly assaulted his then 19-year-old niece? Why did Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher, who have made being vocally pro-victim a major part of their brand, write letters in support of convicted rapist Danny Masterson? I am going to remind you in advance that I am very sorry and I apologize for the inconvenience of me not giving up. What you think? 
There's the possibility that these folks simply believe in the perpetrator's innocence, or at least in the idea that mistakes don't hold a person forever. David O. Russell has never been convicted of any crime, and at the time of R. Kelly's appearance on Do What You Want, neither had he. I think what we've seen through the recent Me Too movement is that too often the victims are not believed, and in this instance, it was certainly, that was certainly the case, that the victims of R. Kelly, the alleged victims of R. Kelly, they weren't believed, and why was that? Women, number one, are harder on other women, uh, and I, I've gone, I've heard lawyers say if they wanted, when they have a rape case or a sexual harassment case, they don't want women on the jury. And why don't they want women on the jury? Because women will say things like, you know, if she hadn't uh, uh, gone to his apartment that late at night, that wouldn't have happened to her. Or if uh, her mother was taken, um, really cared about her, she wouldn't have introduced her to Kelly and let Kelly, R. Kelly, uh, make her part of his little harem. I mean, those are the kinds of things that, that I heard, that people said, that they wrote me letters about and sent me emails about blaming the victim. Definitely when rumors started floating around about R. Kelly and Aaliyah being not only involved but potentially married, uh, music writers I knew were put off. But on the other hand, you had this whole history of uh, adult male musicians who hung out with young girls. Musicians who mentored young girls, you had the history of musicians who married young girl fans. And I think while it was disturbing to people, um, it's very easy to rationalize things. And it's very easy to rationalize things when uh, you're a music writer who's a fan of someone's music, or you're in the industry and you see this flourishing career, not only of Kelly, but of Aaliyah. There's also the possibility that they've committed themselves to that old adage of separating the art from the artist. One of my favorite films about sex and sexual assault is Polanski's Repulsion, and I think one of the things that makes it great is Polanski's keen insight into just how that works. After all, he would know. R. Kelly released some pretty amazing music, much of which clearly had a huge impact on Gaga. I have always been an R. Kelly fan, and actually it is like an epic pastime in the House of Gaga that we just get fucked up and play R. Kelly. But I think there's another angle to consider, one that's more difficult to talk about. Infatuation with abusive artists is not necessarily precluded by their abusive nature, especially when you, yourself, have been abused. As Jonathan Van Meter wrote for Vogue in an article that cemented this aspect of Lady Gaga's star narrative. She was still Stephanie Germanotto when she was raped at 19 by a music producer. It took years. No one else knew. It was almost like I tried to erase it from my brain. And when it finally came out, it was like a big, ugly monster. And you have to face the monster to heal. In late 2016, Gaga revealed in a Today interview that she suffers from PTSD because of the assault. For me, with my mental health issues, half of the battle in the beginning was... I felt like I was lying to the world because I was feeling so much pain, but nobody knew. So that's why I came out and said that I have PTSD, because I don't want to hide any more than I already have to. I can personally speak to the reality of infatuation with abusers, beyond the fact that they are almost universally charming and powerful individuals. For a long time, I empathized with the man who abused me. I knew he himself was physically and sexually abused throughout his youth, and for this I deeply pitied him. I sought to be the one person he could open up to and feel safe with. I wanted very badly to prove my loyalty to him, considering him my best friend and closest confidant. I couldn't picture a life without him until it became necessary to. The grief of having to sever what I perceived as a spiritual connection took an enormous emotional toll. Most of all, I felt selfish for placing my need for safety above his emotional needs. I always worried that he would have no one to talk to with whom he could open up and be himself. In All About Love, Bell Hooks distinguishes this sort of emotional connection as cathexis. When we feel deeply drawn to someone, we cathect with them. That is, we invest feelings or emotion in them. That process of investment, wherein a loved one becomes important to us, is called cathexis. In this book, Peck rightly emphasizes that most of us confuse cathecting with loving. We all know how individuals, feeling connected to someone through the process of cathecting, insist they love the other person even if they are hurting or neglecting them. For years, I believed the man who abused me had loved me, or if he hadn't, that I could help him learn how to love others the way I assumed he wanted to. I was a teenage girl. 
When I heard that love takes effort, I thought that meant I should be taking on projects or suffering under someone. I felt that in understanding his trauma and where it came from, I could help him heal. In turn, perhaps he could learn to love me back. But that changed with time, distance, music, and, you know, the wisdom of a few wonderful books. When we understand love as the will to nurture our own and another spiritual growth, it becomes clear that we cannot claim to love if we are hurtful and abusive. Love and abuse cannot coexist. There is a necessary introspection that comes with healing from abuse, one that calls for examining one's own empathy for their abuser. If you're young and naive like I was, you might think that they couldn't help it or they didn't mean it, and therefore their behavior can be excused. But here's the thing, even if they couldn't help it or they didn't mean it, that doesn't mean it was okay for them to hurt you. The word love is most often defined as a noun, yet all the more astute theories of love acknowledge that we would all love better if we used it as a verb. It's tough to accept that someone you once considered a trusted friend, spouse, lover, hero, or family member could hurt you and others so deeply, especially when those actions existed alongside what you consider to be love. People are complex. I always found it easier to believe that everyone goes through life with good intentions. No one wakes up in the morning to the shining soundtrack as their alarm clock and says to themselves, hee hee, today I will hurt other people for my own amusement, while thunder crackles in the distance. Most of us are just stuck in cycles that have been playing out for a long time, and these cycles must be confronted in order for love to win. We know now that Rilke did not write as he lived, that so many words of love offered us by great men fail us when we come face to face with reality. The belief that love and abuse can coexist, I think, makes us romanticize our abusers. He hit me and it felt like a kiss. He hurt me but it felt like true love. This seems to be the mindset that Gaga was in at the time. Having been abused and just beginning to confront this fact of her history, she found herself intellectually fascinated and eager to empathize. I feel stunned or stunted. You know that feeling when you're on a roller coaster and you're just about to go down the really steep slope? That fear and the drop in your stomach. My diaphragm seizes up, then I have a hard time breathing and my whole body goes into a spasm and I begin to cry. That's what it feels like for trauma victims every day and it's miserable. I always say that trauma has a brain and it works its way into everything that you do. Artistic fascinations often feel inevitable. When writing about abuse, one becomes intellectually obsessed with certain abusers, especially those who are talented at expressing the feelings most of us are forced to hide. And sometimes, when you start to really look into their histories of trauma, it can be easy to see them merely as victims of the same cycle of abuse that you yourself suffered. Many abusers themselves were abused and often used these stories to gain trust and adoration. There's no doubt in my mind that Gaga formed a cathetic attachment to Kelly, first through his music, then in person, one defined by their mutual love of songwriting and performance, and their shared histories of abuse. And this is why I believe whether or not Gaga knew the depth of or believed in R. Kelly's abuse allegations in private, she performed Do What You Want With Him. If you're tired of hearing me talk about sexual abuse and assault in my videos, I'm also tired. But I guess all I can say is that my exhaustion gets killed by my conviction every time. I assume it's the same for Gaga. And I just have to say, as much as it breaks my heart to, Do What You Want is basically a perfect song. This is not an unpopular opinion either. While Dope and Swine received mixed and middling responses, Do What You Want was acclaimed. I highly recommend you go check out Frank and Wayne's Reloaded version, which transforms the song from a duet into a solo pop single. And here's why I consider Do What You Want the thesis of art pop. You can't have her heart, you won't use her mind, you can't stop her voice, you don't own her life, but you can do what you want with her body. As in, if you choose to objectify her, much like Kunz did with his art pop sculpture, she's not afraid. After all, Venus was a nude, and she is all-powerful. Or maybe the Gaga statue serves as the Galatea to Kunz Pygmalion. Through its carving, he has brought art pop to life. 
It is worth remarking that, although transformed, the nymph of Greek mythology rarely gets to escape her abuser entirely. Usually, the mythological pursuant adopts some aspect of their beloved as a personal motif. Apollo, for example, takes leaves from Daphne's tree. He makes and wears a laurel crown, which then becomes a symbol of triumph to the Greeks. In other words, Apollo does what he wants with Daphne's body, but he can't really have any part of her that matters. Usually, a feature of the original entity persists significantly in the transformed entity. A weaver transformed into a spider continues to weave webs. A busy colony of ants becomes an industrious community of humans. A ship metamorphosed into stone retains its shape. The maiden Daphne escapes the erotic pursuit of Apollo by her transformation into a laurel tree, but Apollo adopts laurel as his special plant. I think we all would have loved if that cancelled Kendrick Lamar collaboration had happened instead of the R. Kelly one. God knows. Party Nauseous is a pretty cool song declaring solidarity with Gaga's fans in Indonesia. See, Gaga was forced to cancel her concert, despite not wanting to, after massive protests and serious death threats. She and Lamar then wrote a song about wanting to make peace and bridge gaps to tour widely and meet fans in conservative areas. Party Nauseous was supposed to appear on either Art Pop or Good Kid Mad City, but didn't. Also, I think Lady Gaga was originally supposed to sing the intro to Bitch Don't Kill My Vibe on Good Kid Mad City, but that didn't pan out either. I've got a playlist in the credits with unreleased demos and fan remixes and other supplemental listening materials that you might enjoy if you're intrigued by that sort of thing, but I'm not going to get into it here. In 2015, Gaga was nominated for an Academy Award for Till It Happens to You, theme of the documentary The Hunting Ground. Still a year ahead of Me Too, she performed at the 2016 Oscars with a stage full of other victims of sexual assault. I feel like I've been an advocate, but also a shocked audience member watching Me Too happen. I'm still in disbelief. And I've never come forward and said who molested me, but I think every person has their own relationship with that kind of trauma. And then, in 2019, Gaga formally apologized for duetting with R. Kelly. Overnight, Lady Gaga, the latest star to speak out against R&B star R. Kelly, saying in a statement posted on her Twitter account, I stand behind these women 1,000%, believe them, know they are suffering and in pain, and feel strongly that their voices should be heard and taken seriously. Adding an apology for working with Kelly on their hit collaboration, Do What You Want With My Body. Gaga also announcing she intends to remove the 2013 song from iTunes and other streaming sites. Adding an apology saying, I'm sorry, both for my poor judgment when I was young and for not speaking out sooner. Do What You Want has subsequently been removed from future vinyl and CD pressings of art pop. You won't find it on streaming services, except the remake with Christina Aguilera, which you can disagree with me, but it's just nowhere near as good. I think maybe this is why Gaga now seems to show animosity, or at least regret, regarding the art pop era. It's hard to mature as a person and as an artist and look back on the mistakes you made when you were younger. Inevitable, but painful. Anyways, none of this is like, okay, but my intention is not to excuse Gaga's actions circa 2013, it's to analyze her text with as much empathy as I can muster. So when Gaga tweets, I don't remember art pop, she's probably just stating both a reality of living with PTSD and her desire to separate herself from the album in which she worked with abusers. But part of me wishes she wouldn't. It would probably be more healing if she could accept the person she was then, the mistakes she made while she was suffering. The trouble is, Gaga wasn't seeking acceptance or even love. She was living for the applause. I mean, it was like watching myself. It really was. It was so stunning. It was so stunning. Thank you. If I was held at gunpoint and asked to pick a favorite drag queen, it would always be Sasha Velour. She's thoughtful, forward-thinking, artistic to the bone. I am not at all surprised she chose Gaga's applause to emulate on Drag Race Season 9, which she then won. In an artistic drought, I do often find myself asking what would Sasha Velour do? Perhaps art pop was doomed by even having the word pop in the title. Andrew Barker, contemporaneously writing for Variety, said the following of the album. Yet however short it may fall of Gaga's lofty ambitions, art pop is nonetheless admirable as a sort of throat-clearing mission statement, full of goofy digressions, brave if sometimes foolhardy stylistic explorations, and an emphasis on textures over immediate hooks that may well drive some fence-sitting fans away from Gaga's camp. It's a good point. To me, textures make electronic music worth listening to, but for most, hooks make pop music. The last confession I'm willing to make in this video, and I swear this is the last one, this is all you're getting from me, is that my workout playlist has sounded like this for approximately a decade. Oh, 
I'm an unreliable narrator. I love electronic music, and I'm not going to stop anytime soon. I find myself inclined to argue that the definition of art pop is that it could mean anything, but... My art pop could mean anything. Unfortunately, pop isn't anything yet, it just hypothetically could be. Pop's genre conventions are restrictive, demanding widely accessible tunes. Gaga was already an outlier when she stepped out onto the pop scene with queer, highbrow selections. I can understand how, for most audiences, art pop was a nudge too far. Things have changed quite a bit in the last decade. PC music happened for one, introducing hyperpop to the world through the embrace of consumerist aesthetics. Hyperpop celebrates the gaudy, ultra-feminine, sometimes hard to listen to aspects of pop decades past. Maybe in another universe, Art Pop was a successful album produced and performed by the likes of Sophie, AJ Cook, or Hannah Diamond. On the other hand, maybe the fact that Art Pop came out before PC music proves that it was right on the pulse, if not a little ahead of the curve. Was Art Pop ahead of its time? I mean, yeah, yeah, it was. This is one of those rare times where that cliche, people weren't ready for it, absolutely applies. Art Pop's production is heavy and noisy as fuck, sometimes bordering on industrial. It's fantastic, sometimes reminiscent of early avant-garde acts like Throbbing Gristle, sometimes reminding the listener of today's candy-coated glitch pop like Slater or Aisha Erotica. The whole thing sounds like a rave in a museum, and I personally couldn't love it more. It is pure thrill and opulence. Applause was Art Pop's most successful single, and it's also the album closer. This is the part of the album where Gaga realizes she can't just float around forever, and she rededicates her life to her audience. This gives Applause an increasingly tragic tone upon each re-listen, to me at least. I want to end this video by talking about Jeff Koontz's ever controversial gazing balls, including the one he put between Gaga's legs. Kuhn's gazing balls are attached to paintings and sculptures in order to show at once the art and the audience, the act of looking at the art directly juxtaposed with the image of the looker. In this way, the audience is intrinsically the art. One cannot really exist without the other. The gazing balls are devices of connecting. I want to participate. I always just wanted to be involved in a dialogue with the avant-garde. This is my family. These are the artists that I have interest in, the joy that has enriched my life. Whether you buy into Kuntz as a capital A artist or not, it's clear that the sentiment that art should be device for connection, reflection, and sensory joy is what art pop is meant to convey. The sad reality is that Lady Gaga is kind of a Tinkerbell figure. Without applause, she dies. Because Gaga doesn't exist, she can only live in an altered state dressed to the nines in the public eye. So if you want to see her, you swine had better put your hands up. Because when they bang the gong, that's it. Gaga goes, and your chances of seeing the girl behind the aura go with her. What we will be left with when that day comes are images like this one. Of Gaga, yes, and of us. I fell apart after I released this album. Thank you for celebrating something that once felt like destruction. We always believed it was ahead of its time. Years later, turns out, sometimes artists know. And so do little monsters. Pause up. Before I go, I'm going to let you listen to an iPhone voice notes recording from last year I found while making this video. I often record myself practicing because I want to get better at playing my instrument and singing. This is a recording of a time when I was quite low, singing dope on my childhood bed, banjo in hand. It's pitchy and amateurish, but it made me realize that dope has a way of finding me when I resurface from a hard time. It was hard to come back home and remember that I stopped doing music as my main creative outlet because of a few unkind words. It seems obvious in retrospect why someone who abused you might not want you to have a voice. Maybe dope and art pop generally isn't just about how trauma changes the relationships we have with our sexuality, our audience, and our bodies. Maybe too, it's about finding your voice and new reasons to sing again. That, to me, is what art pop means. I know I fucked up again Cause I've lost my only friend God forgive my sins Don't leave me, I I'd hate myself until I die
last one, last puff, two last regrets, three spirits and twelve lonely steps up heaven's stairway to gold. Mind myself like coal, mountain of hit soul. Each day I cry. I feel so low from the dead high. My heart would break without you. Might not awake without you. Been hurt and low from living. I for so long. I'm sorry and I love you. See you with me. Cause I need you more than dope I need you more than dope Need you more than dope Need you more than dope I need you more than dope Need you more I need you more than dope Hey kids, do you like podcasts? Podcasts about music? You should check out 12 Tone and Polyphonic's Nebula original, Ghost Notes. They have fascinating discussions on form and composition, as well as more casual conversations about being a music fan. I was delighted to be a guest earlier this year where I got to enthuse about various artists I love, including Pink Floyd and others mentioned in this video. People often talk about her like she's this very disingenuous figure and that, you know, oh, the reputation yeah. era was evil Taylor, was her persona. And I was like, I think that's actually called being like a self-aware late 20 something. <laughs> you can hear Ghost Notes wherever you listen to podcasts, but if you want early and ad-free access, that comes with your Nebula subscription for no added cost. I'll also be releasing a Nebula original soon. I can't tell you much yet, but I can tell you that it's a work I couldn't produce elsewhere because it deals with highly sensitive subject matter. But Nebula's taking a chance on me either way. Honestly, Nebula's focus on originals has been a godsend for me personally. Their focus on supporting independent artists has meant the production of a play and a movie, as well as tons of other originals that YouTube would readily ban for being too explicit. Nebula is also where you can find all of my videos, including Why Are Disney Adults, which was taken down on YouTube copyright grounds. But instead of giving up and letting the mouse consume my life, I'm sticking with Nebula. So what are you waiting for? Go to nebula.tv slash Lola Sebastian right now to get 40% off an annual subscription on me. She prayed to her father, the river god. Oh, oh, I did not Google this first. Give me a second to redo this. <laughs> I'm, it's sorry, it's spelled a little like penis, which is not, I don't want to say it that way. Pronounce names .com. Oh my god. Pinyos. What? Pinyos. It, please don't tell me it's pronounced like, it literally is pronounced like penis. Fuck. <laughs> this, this, this fake Greek AI is not helping. It literally is telling, Paneas? This is not. Paneas. Okay. That, that, stop saying it. I, <laughs> that you're making me read things like the gazing balls. <laughs> Pinius and the gazing balls. Thanks, Lo. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. I'm gonna have like a full I'm gonna have a full conniption. I'm gonna just restart this whole thing.